Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for IBM Pulse, IBM's premier cloud show. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. It's exclusive IBM coverage. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined with my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org, and our next guest is Steve Mills, Senior Vice President, Group Executive, IBM Software and Systems. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you. Um, boy, IBM's had a lot of transitions over the years, but this one is pretty, pretty big. The cloud is a big growth driver. Numbers are being forecasted. Uh, technology code is being written on the keynote opening day. Mm -hmm. Big developer focus. Same game to IBM, but just different, 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 different players and elements to it. Uh, what's your perspective on this transition? And you've been part of many historically at a IBM. Lot. So, what's your take <laughs> on the on the current cloud transition right now? Well, you know, each uh, one of these um, inflection points or changes um, has both similarities to things that have happened in the past, but also differences. You know, the, uh, what, the, what's fascinating about the information technology industry is that uh, in some respects you get to redo things that you had done before, but the technology is advanced to allow you now to do things in ways that you could never have done previously. So you're working on similar kinds of prob business problems and challenges, but the technology now has made it possible for you to do it more economically, do it faster, more effective, and you kind of get a chance to, to sort of do it again right. You know, it's the third time is a charm type of thing. You know, and, and certainly around uh, these uh, cloud-based implementations, you know, we're working with customers all over the world to help them, uh, in a sense, rethink their business processes, make them more fluid, more open, more dynamic, um, and the cloud plays a part in that. And you get the computing industry, IBM's been a big part of it from the beginning, and doing business, solving customer problems. You got computing, you got software at the heart of it, right? Software defined, everything. You got software, the middle layer being discussed here. What, what gets you excited about the changes in the computing landscape and the software landscape as it kind of blends together in this hybrid, um, software defined, software driven, data driven economy? Well, you know, um, I get very excited about the fact that we can do things at a scale today that we could never have imagined uh, a decade ago. Um, this, this ability to take on some really big, challenging problems, to, to analyze things in ways that we uh, simply couldn't afford to do before. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more data. Obviously, you throw in a little bit of mobile and social, and, and you get all these little twists and turns, and it becomes a multi-dimensional uh, challenge. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we're seeing uh, with the current set of shifts is that uh, uh, more so perhaps than ever before, we're seeing the combinatorial effects of many different aspects of technology coming together and therefore impacting the way in which you have to look at problems, uh, think about solving them, the technologies that are available to you to attack the problems, different ways to experience uh, the technology. Obviously mobile devices have had a profound effect upon the, you know, what's happening in the way in which applications are being built going forward. So in truth, it's never been a more exciting time. It's also never been more challenging for our clients in terms of trying to figure out, well, given all these changes and all the possibilities, what do I do first? You know, show me a pathway, a roadmap to uh, taking advantage of all these changes. We saw yesterday a demo of, of an application being written on stage in, in just a matter of, of mm -hmm. minutes. You're obviously excited about that. You Absolutely. This morning yeah. in your, Especially in your, since it all worked on stage. Yes, <laughs> right. you, you never know, right? it was a live demo. Um, what do you think that means for the, the, the development community in terms of the number of developers that are going to be attracted to developing mm -hmm. code and how organizations are going to respond to that? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, it's going to get harder and harder to differentiate um, you know, who is a developer of technology, or, or at least code. I mean, hardware will always have its unique attributes, but when it comes to software, uh, people will both develop and consume. You know, we're, we're watching this today. We're watching uh, people, various walks of life that are producing you know, downloadable apps, uh, you know, the explosion you know, on the Apple App Store type of thing, Android apps. Uh, uh, it's opening up the aperture for lots of creativity. Um, and oftentimes those that perhaps don't have traditional computer science training but have an understanding of a business problem, the tools are there, scripting, simple interfaces, and suddenly you're doing things creatively um, and building useful software that frankly you could not have done years ago if you hadn't gone to school and, and picked up the entire uh, you know, litany of skills associated with information technology. So I wonder if we could maybe go to memory lane here. So you've you've been around and seen a number of transitions as we talked about. You, I kind of think look at you as the Bill Belichick of the you know the I, IT industry, and you've earned it. Uh, the the know, big tuna. Lot of, yeah, the big tuna, right? <laughs> so 
But you take you, you you were an architect, and you always say, "Well, I had a lot of help." But uh, you know, the if not the an architect of, of IBM's transition into you know software, um, and uh, obviously things like WebSphere, you're you're pulling learnings from from that. How do you um, compare sort of the the changes that we're going through now? What learnings can you pull through when you look at things like Blue Mix and this whole opportunity around around Pass? And what gives you confidence that you can take this forward? Well, uh, if we look at the little demo that was done on stage uh, yesterday, um, you know, this is all very much around construction more so than programming, right? It's 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 changing the paradigm, you know, away from something that is purely of a technical nature, uh, and allowing composition, you know, allowing create creativity and expression to occur. And, and granted, the gentleman up demonstrating certainly had technical skills, so he wasn't a neophyte by any means. Uh, but what he did wasn't all that profound. When you looked at it on the glass, you'd say, well, gee, I, I could have done that. You know, gee, that, that looks pretty simple. You know, that, that's the kind of he thing He memorized I, it as fast as he could. <laughs> yeah, he didn't <laughs> finger much. That's the kind of thing I want to work with. Right, you know, that, that's sure. something I could uh, take advantage of. I don't need to, you know, to have a graduate degree in computer science to, to understand how I would manipulate, you know, that tool set, those components, link these things together. It's all very visual. You know, it's logical construction, wiring together. You know, and, and frankly, this is the kind of thing that uh, dramatically expands um, the, the adoption of information technology. How do you move it away from the high priests and priestesses you know, and make it more, more accessible to all kinds of, of uh, uh, developers, many of whom, again, are not going to have the kind of formalized training. Um, and so I think that these are powerful models. And we've been working on these models for a very long time. The idea of scripting things together is not a new idea. The, you know, the, some of the computer science So it's a new user. I mean, basically what you're saying is a new user of computer science is the user itself. And there could be yeah. a data analyst yeah. Yeah. Uh, using data science stuff. Well, increasingly self-directed. You know, I want to use the technology the way I want to use it. Um, how can I lay it out? How can I assemble it? Can I get mass customization? Can different users have their own particular personalized experience? And yet, fundamentally, you're still working off the same, uh, the same component parts. As if we're all given the, you know, the same box of crayons. You know, we all get the full Crayola set, but what we choose to draw with it is of our own making. You know, and our our, our own creativity. What's your strategy to win the developer ecosystem? I mean, obviously, that's going to be the telltale sign. In an open framework, you get Cloud Foundry, you get OpenStack, got a lot of other open initiatives, and that's open's not new to IBM at all. You guys have been involved in open source for you know many many uh, decades, but now you have this DevOps culture. Um, Dave and I say, you know, they're like they eat glass and spit mm -hmm. nails. These guys, they don't want to deal with configurations of hardware. They just want to push code, mm -hmm. have versioning control, yeah. all that stuff automated completely for them. Mm -hmm. That's the DevOps way. That is like these young well, guys. Well, I, I think you've, you've just a fine part of it. They're looking for the environment. The environment needs to be welcoming. Um, there needs to be the ability to play, to experiment, the sandbox. Um, you know, I want to have a lot of working material, a lot of components. You know, it, it, it really is about creativity. You know, given my craft and my skills, if you give me you know, good tools, more working material, I can create more things. Um, and so the environment has to has to be adaptive, and many of the things that that will provide are not IBM unique. You know, they come out of the open systems world, uh, open tooling, uh, open components. You know, we're looking for this Bluemix environment to be contributory. We want to actually encourage not just IBMers but our, our customers, our partners, to you know push things into Bluemix, uh, use it as an environment that becomes the kickstart mechanism, if you will, for, for building next generation applications. So, so you run quite a quite a portfolio. And, and of course, I think of you. Many observers as you know, starting as a, a software guy, even though you predated the whole software strategy. But but then you, when you inherited the the hardware business, you are an executive that spends a lot of time, you know, in in all your businesses. I know I know that just by observing you. But you made a decision, you and your team, to exit the x86 uh, server business. I wonder if you could could talk about that. Um, why that decision? Was it purely a tactical financial decision? And what does this mean? for the organization, your organization going forward? Are you shifting resources towards software? Are you sharpening the focus on hardware? I wonder if you could discuss that a bit. So what we sold our selling to Lenovo um, is our, our base x86 business. Uh, there are some elements of that business that we're not selling, uh, things that we sell as software, pure app, pure data, Netiza, cast iron, um, the, uh, data power, ISS, appliances. We have a number of different things which we really sell as software, but they come with hardware. And they're Intel-based, and we're going to continue to make those things and sell them. 
Um, so we're not, we're not exiting all aspects of the Intel space. But frankly, it is, it is very much an economic decision. It, it's looking at, at where the margins are, where the margins are going. Uh, margins are unbelievably stressed in the x86 desktop business. We sold that in 2005. They're unbelievably stressed in the server business. Clearly, Intel gets the inventor's profit from x86. There's a need for distribution. The distributors are VAD, the VADs and VARs, as it were. They'll continue to deliver x86-based systems. But frankly, the, the in-between profit margins have been literally squeezed out. Um, and you know, we've reached that point where we concluded there just wasn't the ability to make the kind of money we wanted to make in delivering hardware as hardware, uh, at least around x86. Now, we look at power and, and our mainframe. You know, we are the inventor. We get the inventor's profit. Inventor's profit, packager's profit, distribution profit, those profit pools are accessible to us in the, in the uh, x86-based world. The access to the profit pools just weren't there, except for those things that, that are, in effect, software that wraps around the hardware and then is sold as software. NetEase is a wonderful example. It's very much a part of our software business. It carries software you know, type margins. Um, it's highly differentiated, but the software is what differentiates the technology. So does that free up resource for you to double down on the inventor's side, profit side of the hardware business, or do you divert those resources to, to software, or is it not that, that Well, it, it, it's not either or, it's actually both. You know? And, and uh, you know, certainly, we're going to continue to be a systems company. Uh, we're in the storage business, and, and over time, much of our storage investment actually has been software, not hardware, because we're not producing you know, magnetic rotating disks. We're one of the biggest providers of flash, solid state disk, uh, technology in the industry. We obviously acquire that from third parties. We package it with a control unit, a lot of software. Um, and so there are a lot of these software-enabled offerings in the marketplace that are changing the nature of the hardware business. Talk about the big data opportunity in that respect. Obviously you guys are all in on big data. We're hearing a lot of Watson conversations at the front end. Is Watson going to answer all the business questions uh, rather than Jeopardy questions? Is it going to answer all the data center questions around you know, uh, sensors and Internet mm -hmm. of Things? Um, and how does that fit into the, kind of, you've seen the API economy stripe across multiple units within IBM software-wise. Is it the same for big data uh, in terms of strategy-wise? Well, um, but let's separate a little bit of Watson from the, the big data. So, so Watson clearly is a big data yeah. system. <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it, it is a system. Um, and if you're patient uh, and you keep feeding it information, it becomes all-knowing. Uh, and so, you know, it's not a matter of what Watson can do, but rather where, what's, where is Watson a practical solution to a particular problem, and where does that problem get satisfied using other technology that don't necessarily need Watson. So you think about, about the problem sets. Uh, there are things in the world that have um, very deterministic characteristics. You know, I'm collecting data, uh, that data is understood, it's well formatted, I might have to filter it and organize it and structure it in a way that I can then mine the data. But I don't necessarily need the kind of sophisticated inferencing that a Watson system provides. We have a huge portfolio, we've, we've invested more than 20 billion acquiring uh, technologies around analytics and, and uh, information management. It's a big investment area for IBM, it's one of the fastest growing parts of our business. Um, and we are clearly a market leader in this whole area related to big data and analytics. Watson really represents um, a set of capabilities, it's really a set of capabilities that are brought together in a system that's designed to deal with complex problems where the amount of information is huge and the nature and the structure of the information makes it very challenging to know what the right answer is. It does a good job of human, humanizing too, the whole big data kind of you know, results. Well, we've made it, we've and, made it appear yeah. that way. You know, it, it's, uh, you know it, it's still a machine. It's like right? I tell, tell my kids, you eat you know? good, you'll be healthy. With Watson, you feed it the right data, it, it does a good job. Well, you have to feed, you have to feed <laughs> no it. No junk data. You have to feed it a lot of data, but you also have to teach it the truth. Yeah. You know, it, it's like a child. It doesn't know what's right and wrong. You teach the truth to the system. And as those truths increase, what happens is the system does statistics. I mean, it's a big math engine. And it, it calculates, uh, based upon new information that you present to it, whether or not the new information appears to be similar to, correlated to, related to what it already knows, and it gives you back a probability 
you know, hopefully a high probability, you know, that what you've now presented to the system, you know, relates to these things, and therefore I can constantly ingest more facts, more information related to what I know. It's sort of the way your brain works, yeah. sort of, kind of. Dave always wants to know, is there a single version of the truth? And I think we have yeah, heard there, the there, answer. It's there, there, there's a statistical <laughs> version of the truth, and Watson, Watson yeah, yeah, right. has the statistical version yeah. of the truth. All right, I, know, I know you're tight on time, but real quick, acquisitions, uh, M&A, organic, you guys have done a great job of balancing. Uh, maybe a word on your strategy there and what makes you so good at acquisitions? Well, our strategy has been consistent. That's one of the things that, that has made it a good, uh, a good approach for us in the marketplace. Um, we have a big portfolio, but uh, as we engage with our customers, we certainly discover things we don't have. And you know, the decisions there are, do you make it? Uh, do you partner with somebody to get that technology that helps fill out your solution, or do you buy? Uh, and buying certainly is a, has been a good strategy for us. Um, we buy things that fit with what we have. We believe in adjacency. Uh, we want things to be synergistic with what we have. I, if it's the right company, fits well with the things we have, uh, we get tremendous growth. You, know, you, lo you look at, um, um, uh, going back a year or so, the acquisition of Worklight. You know, great acquisition, a little tiny company. Uh, really had a, at that, their size, going to have a hard time scaling that business. You know, in, in a very short period of time, you know, we've, we've moved that product out to well over 400 customers around the world, you know, with a company that was really just getting started. Great technology, but just getting started. Well, you know, you put it in the IBM company environment with all of our sellers and all our market reach, and you get this incredible lift. You know, and you, you're watching this happen with uh, Fiberlink, you know, for example. Uh, certainly, uh, you'll watch it happen with Cloudant, you know, and, and again, the profile of these companies tends, tends to be relatively small. You know, we tend to not buy things that are that are big, but they fit well with what we have, um, and they are they are sort of the missing link. It's the puzzle piece that completes the picture, and everybody goes, "Aha! I really need that!" Right? And boom, things take off. Steve Mills here inside the Cube, senior executive, legend with an IBM veteran, uh, been through all the uh, wars in IBM, all the successes, all the transitions, looking good with the cloud software at the center of it. Systems are back, computer science uh, from from programmers to analysts to users is uh, part of IBM's major, major efforts. Big data, cloud, middleware, software. This is theCUBE, our exclusive coverage of IBM Pulse. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break.